Hello, everybody. My name is Scott Mordell. I'm the CEO of YPO. YPO stands for the Young Presidents Organization. It's a peer-to-peer -peer learning association for CEOs around the world. We have CEOs in more than 140 countries, almost 30,000 of them, and we pride ourselves on person-to-person -person learning, which is exactly what this meeting is all about. I'm thrilled to be able to be here with you to talk about preparing for an entrepreneurial gale post-COVID. We all know that the COVID pandemic has affected everything around the world, whether when it comes to people's behaviors, the health, of course, and the economy. And many people have been staggered as a result of this and continue to find their way through as we go forth. However, we know that business is a force of good, especially as we all move beyond COVID um, uh, for the economic contributions that business can be. All of our societies are fed by business and commerce in some way, shape, or form. And with the small, medium enterprises being the backbone of job creation and the backbone of so much innovation around the world, we're here to talk about Asian entrepreneurs and about how they can overcome and succeed in this time of incredible change and also um, incredible opportunity as that would go. We have a fantastic panel here. We have Greg Crichton, Managing Director, Greater Asian Advisors, based in Hong Kong. We have Pina Hirano, a Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Asteria in Japan. We have Manesh Pore, Co-Founder and CEO of The Buy Hive. And we have Diana Sebrain, Co-Founder, One Agrix in Singapore. We also have another member, Edgar uh, Belliser, and we're hoping he can join us as, as, as that would go as well. In our discussion today, we would hope to provide insights for Asian entrepreneurs and all of you attending, thank you, to identify the trends and opportunities for entrepreneurs after COVID, and also to provide important insights and advice for entrepreneurs based in our panel's experiences and perspectives and very diverse points of way to come to the economies as we go. Everybody brings unique perspectives to these kinds of discussions, and we encourage you to ask questions. And with that, why don't we get started? So, Manesh, I'd like to start with you, if we may. Um, out of crisis comes opportunity. How are economics different for Asian entrepreneurs after COVID than before? Um, so, I, I myself have been in the corporate world, Scott, for the longest time, and this is the first year of being an entrepreneur. Uh, so it's very interesting uh, to see how uh, how COVID has affected us. But being in Asia, the one big advantage that I see is uh, the agility and the speed at which we can move, the speed at which we can pivot, and the cost of that pivot is not that heavy. And from my perspective, personally, I feel that COVID is the ideal time for anybody uh, with an entrepreneur mindset to experiment because this is the year when uh, no matter what we did, if we failed, we could blame it on COVID. If we succeeded, we would be happy. So this this to me is the was the biggest opportunity, at least of my lifetime, where I could say, I'm going to do this. If it fails, I'll blame it on COVID. Thank you very, very much. Um, Diane, I'd like to direct the same question to you. Um, how are economics different for Asian entrepreneurs after COVID than before? Well, um, if, if you know, I, I, I do see COVID-19 as um, uh, a time for us to, like what Minesh said, to pivot and um, to also drive upon that SMEs, we can contribute to our economies. And as you said, uh, uh, rightfully, Scott, you said about how, um, you know, SMEs are the backbone of um, economies, well, this is a great time to digitalize. Um, if you look at ASEAN alone, there's about 600 million population. Um, the penetration of, of um, mobile is higher, much higher now. In fact, we have one of the highest mobile penetration in ASEAN, I'm talking about ASEAN um, itself, and 60% um, are the youth. So, you know, and, and if you look at um, my generation, um, um, millennials, Gen Z, we are about innovation. We are about um, starting companies. And like what Minesh said, um, I mean, it's, it's the best time to start a business right now. Obviously, there are um, headwinds. Um, we can talk about challenges later, but, but let's keep it positive at the beginning. Um, it's the right time to start a business. We have a great um, infrastructure building in numerous Asian countries right now when it comes to startups um, ac across um, the board. So this is, I feel that now is an opportunity 
for us um, to actually build businesses to fail as much as we can, um, <laughs> eliminate COVID-19 if you, if you may, but um, at the same time also pivot. Um, I think existing companies should also pivot right now. Um, as, as what Miner said in Asia, it is not that expensive um, to, to, to run a company, to start and to fail. Thank you very much, Diana. I'd like to turn it over to Hirano san for the same question relatively. Um, given your experience within technology space as well as going to publicly listing an incredible success in that way, what do you see different now uh, after COVID than, than we had before? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the, what I see uh, in Tokyo or the Japan is uh, the, as for the company, especially for the, uh, the startup, they that two divided situation. Um, one is very good because of the COVID and uh, the other is uh, very bad because of the COVID. Mm -hmm. So the very good companies uh, tend to uh, technology or the digital based company. And the uh, other is a startups uh, related to more travel or the food and drinks and related companies. And uh, and also, the, as for the fundraising, uh, the, if, even most of the old company facing bad situation. So the, although the stock market is enjoying their prices, but the, actually the variation that the venture capital or the angels give them is uh, lower than before. So such is the uh, kind of stuff is a uh, situation. And uh, I think, um, the all of the uh, startups and uh, even the listed company need to uh, go digital if uh, they are not. Um, actually, my company uh, listed the because of the COVID, our profit was uh, record high from the establishment. So the, there's a lot of chance, as uh, people said, uh, of the transform the business uh, because of COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very insightful. Um, and Greg, um, how about, what do you see before and after uh, from your perspective? Well, I guess firstly, I'm the odd man out here because I'm, I'm not doing a startup and um, <laughs> obviously I've been around for quite a while. Uh, so I'm a small time angel investor really. Uh, but uh, but I, I think uh, what, I'd, what I'd like to start off with is just to point out uh, something that came out from Channel News Asia and they they identified a number of particular areas which they think are the main areas that are going to benefit from COVID and, and post-COVID. And those areas are food security, uh, healthcare, uh, education, online communication and logistics. And if we have time, I'm happy to talk about those areas. But I think there's one other area that, uh, that they did miss out on, uh, and that's sustainability. And I was, I was talking to a friend in Palo Alto uh, over the weekend uh, who informed me that Stanford has just created for the first time in the world a, a course on sustainability. It'll be a degree course in sustainability. And, of course, things that they're going to focus on is uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so uh, I, think, I think CNA should should add that to their to their list but, uh, but they're the, the main areas um, so when we have time um, I'm happy to talk about those well well thank you Greg and thank you everybody uh, we've all had a chance to get in so here we'll, we'll, we'll handle some 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 questions and, and and see where we can go with that speaking of sustainability so much has been written around the world about uh, you know businesses um, being more sustainable and being smart that way and somehow making that aspect of life become part of their business and therefore um, bus the business of sustainability should be profitable when it's all said and done. Coming out of COVID and, and all of the rest, I'm curious, we've got different countries uh, and different business uh, uh, areas represented here. Um, how is How are you seeing sustainability play out? Uh, beyond Greg, really, back back to Manesh and Haranasan and, and Diana, are you seeing sustainability become big? And, and anything you want to say about that relative to our uh, our audience? Yeah. So let me start and I'll tell you from a sourcing industry perspective, right? Uh, it is it is one of the sectors that is uh, 
that is going to be affected out of COVID, the supply chain, the sourcing industry, uh, it is going to change forever and change probably for the good, I would say. Uh, a few aspects of the sourcing industry or the manufacturing industry, and Asia is the capital of manufacturing, especially China. Um, you can immediately see uh, that the impact of COVID uh, with the trade war combined together is going to be forcing into place new regulations, new regulations related to SDG, uh, new regulations related to uh, sustainable goals of the, of the WTO, and uh, the new impact of both uh, the Paris Agreement as well as the RCEP. And all of them are at some point of time covering aspects uh, which relate to sustainability brought into uh, manufacturing. From our side, right, I, uh, I, what we started with Byhive, uh, the main reason we started Byhive was to provide a sustainable solution for buyers who are traveling to Asia almost on a weekly basis to do sourcing. And now when they cannot travel, we provide them freelance labor or freelance sourcing professionals that will do the work for them. It is a completely sustainable model because you've got these people in Asia who are losing jobs and you give them jobs. But at the same time, it's sustainable also from an environmental perspective because buyers don't have to fly and use carbon footprints. And the future is going to be such tools, not just ours, but in across different industries where you will provide uh, provide uh, tools where you don't have to travel, whether it is through Zoom or whether it is through freelancers, these things are becoming more and more important. And I think that is a big change that sustainability uh, will be a part of or will be playing a role on how the solutions will be developed. Thank you and very then. much, Manesh. Uh, uh, Diana? Yes, um, th th this is a very interesting um, subject because when we built One Agrix, it's built on um, sustainability as the heartbeat of the company. Mm -hmm. And why we do so, because we are dealing with agri-food um, and agricultural and the halal sector. And we address the food security issues that would come um, in the next um, decade. Um, even, even more. So when, when we say about sustainability and moving food cross border, um, we are talking about, you know, also serving, um, the SDGs, which one of them is zero hunger. Now, uh, and also, um, elevation of, um, elevating of, um, the farmers, um, economic, um, standing and status. So what we do is we eliminate the exploitative middleman. And why I say exploitative middleman is, in Asia, you still need um, certain intermediaries in between to trade. And anyone who say they can disrupt entirely middlemen, they do not understand the food sector well enough. And um, why I, I say uh, this um, as, as a point of sustainability is because farmers right now earn less, a lot of them, there are 500 million farmers in the world, about only one less than a dollar. So what One Agrix is doing is encouraging these farmers globally to come on board to, to um, at least um, increase their, their, you know, their, their daily wage. Um, so in that sense, um, as a platform, um, not only us, uh, like Minesh said, um, in the sourcing industry, many um, platforms that are going digital, you will see that as a sustainability play because um, very much these small, medium enterprises, these farmers, they could earn much more margins than before. Um, I, I recall reading a, a Stanford paper, if I'm not mistaken, where they talk about the food industry and there's about eight middlemen in between. And that's a lot of middlemen. And those middlemen, they make most of the money. So there's no sustainability there. Whereas on a platform model, we can do that. We give that opportunity. Um, at the same time, when you make, when, when you help farmers and SMEs have better margins, you know, they can improve their lives. For farmers, we can, we, we do have uh, stories telling us they could, um, sustain their families better. So sustainability is an important uh, subject, which um, Greg has actually, you know, mentioned that CNA should have mentioned it because sustainability is what um, would be the backbone of economies as well, not just um, entrepreneurship, not not just um, digitalization or digital transformation. Thank you. They're certainly all related in different ways. And so, Hirano san, uh, relative to technology transformation and also just uh, sustainability, um, what do you foresee there? Yeah, uh, I think uh, because of this uh, situation, COVID situation, technology got a more important uh, mission and sustainability. 
um, because uh, the world uh, cannot uh, recome back uh, to the original one. So the people are restricted to travel, communications, and move all the even even the business trips. So the what uh, we need uh, to do for sustainability is uh, some alternative of the way of doing business or communication or having fun uh, using uh, the technologies. The easier way is uh, like a virtual reality and uh, telecommunication stuff. But uh, in addition to that, uh, we need to contribute more on the people feeling stuff. Uh, not only the true, but the more uh, more getting onto the uh, the feeling um, teams or feeling the people or human kind of stuff, uh, which uh, is planned to be uh, five years, ten years later. But uh, now, uh, because of COVID, uh, our technology sector need to rush uh, developing those uh, technology that uh, keep people happy. Then uh, the, the sustainability for the each person and the society, community, and the country um, will be uh, supported. So, yeah, that's our mission is more increased. That's my take. Fantastic. Th thank you very much. Now I'd like to move toward the entrepreneurs with some of our conversation here as, as we would go. Um, certainly, we cannot speak of Asia as a uniform market, right? I mean, we all know this. Uh, every, every place has different opportunities and different situations. Um, but but starting a business is um, in, in some ways uh, similar, though. Um, so I'm curious what advice any of you might have uh, uh, relative to somebody who's wanting to start a business. Um, what would be your advice? And, and just for everybody's benefit, we have a panel here where people come from very different backgrounds. We have angel investing. We have coming from corporate. We have uh, um, uh, just uh, from all the way up from a startup into a, in a big public company, and just we just we're blessed here today, everybody. So, so these insights from from everybody would be would be very fantastic. So, um, who'd like to go first? What, what what advice would you have for somebody thinking to start a business at this stage? I, I can go on that because okay. I started the business this year, uh, and I have never done it before, so I had no <laughs> idea. I've never been an investor. Always worked in corporates, big companies. Uh, Frankly speaking, uh, just from a starting a business perspective, I think uh, Hong Kong and Singapore are the easiest places in the world today to start businesses. Uh, we, we did for ourselves, we, uh, before registering the company, we were exploring Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Delaware, and Nevada. And we looked at all the different options uh, that were available to us between these four places. And uh, frankly, we started the process of doing it in Hong Kong, Delaware, uh, Nevada at the same time. And Hong Kong process was two days. I got everything sorted out in two, literally two flat days from opening a bank account to getting the company registered. Everything was done. I, I would say it was 72 hours max, right? Uh, so from that point of view, that is amazing. Uh, in U.S., so when I did the company in uh, Nevada, uh, we decided to go for Nevada instead of Delaware. Uh, after we opened the, it took about ten days to get the company all the documentations done, and it took us about fifteen days after that to open the bank account. So that was a month lost, and for a startup, a month lost is a lot. Yes, yes. Well said. Well said. Any other advice? Um, who'd like to go? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah okay. So for the new startups, uh, what I say is a make very flexible plan. So not stick with the original plan. So because uh, the, uh, the world is changing, environment is changing. So don't hesitate the uh, people, the tactics. That is very important. And then in Japan, uh, there's uh, many business business people uh, likes PDCA. Maybe um, many knows PDCA. Um, plan and do uh, check and action. <clears throat> but the PDCA, uh, I'd say, uh, doesn't work in this kind of situation. Instead, I would recommend UDA, O-O-D-A, which is the method of uh, U.S. Navy. So the world is changing, environment changing, every time changing. So be flexible. That is my advice. 
Great advice. Great advice. Uh, Diana? Yes, um, uh, I've, I've always, when, when I speak at conferences and when, when people ask what advice you give entrepreneurs, I would always say adopt an open mindset and um, O stands for opportunity, identify opportunities, um, look at the problems that you can solve. And um, that, that is where also you can stand a chance using technology um, to, to be sustainable because you're solving an actual problem. Um, I, I've seen startups building up with no actual <laughs> problems to solve. And that's where that's the first point of failure. If you do not identify those um, opportunities and those problems to solve, then um, P stands for people. Um, increasingly, when, when you build a company, you're also um, building a team. So your people is your, your, you know, your, your drive for you to drive forward your company. So treat them right. Um, when I talk about people also, when you build um, technology, technologies, it needs to be used for good. You're serving lives, right? And um, so this is where the alignment with the SDGs, with sustainability is important. Um, e, evolve, always be evolving. Technology is but a tool. It's a commodity. And you need to always um, be ready to pivot. That's important. It's not an outcome. Um, building a startup, if you see technology as an outcome, you will not do well. Um, I, I, I try not to use the word fail. Then um, comes the next one, which is N, which is network. Always be building strategic alliances. Always be building partnerships. Increasingly in COVID-19, um, companies who build partnerships will go further um, and, and look at it in an ecosystem um, perspective. Because there's no one company that could, you know, monopolize industries. And we've seen some. Um, we know the stories out there, but they, that would mean they will not be sustainable. And um, I do not really like to talk about uh, One Agrix here, but this is what the One Agrix has been doing. That's why um, we were mentioned in World Economic Forum about uh, a case study that actually built a minimal viable ecosystem. So this is the open mindset which I would like to share with all entrepreneurs. And um, yeah, that's um, a bit of my advice. Fantastic. Th thank you very much. And, and Greg, uh, so many perspectives from angel investing on up. I'm, I'm just curious what uh, what advice you might want to have to add. Starting a company is is easy in uh, Hong Kong and Singapore. It's, um, it's, it's no problem at all to do that. But that is a very small part of the challenge for any startup. Uh, having an idea is is easy, but that is also a very small issue. Um, as uh, as I think I mentioned to you guys before, 90% of the startups in the UK have failed this year. Only 10% are left. So you can't just look at it from that perspective. In fact, a discussion that I was having over the weekend uh, with uh, with this, this friend in Palo Alto who is a serial entrepreneur. You'd know him from Angry Birds and a few other things that he's done. Um, and, and we were talking about how... Uh, if a founder of a company lets the uh, the venture capitalists who invest in them to take more of the of the um, initiative in developing their business, then that is going to be a very difficult thing. So when you're talking about uh, creating relationships, you're talking about distribution. It's the founders who have to be involved and they have to take the lead. They have to take the opportunities, not the people who are, who are financing them. The people who are financing them can make introductions. Uh, they can do the KPIs and, and have uh, a, a lot of benefit that they can offer, but it has to be a direct contact with the distribution and the founders, because otherwise it's not it's not going to it's not going to succeed. And the other thing too is is uh, and and this is not so much um, a a technological aspect, but the distribution and revenue are, are key. If you if you don't line up your distribution and your revenue is not there, particularly in this COVID situation. Uh, there's going to be a, a lot of fallout from from guys who are prepared to to back you, and and when you when you've um, you've got no runway left, uh, then I'm afraid if you go back to the the guys who have been funding you and you haven't got that distribution in place and you haven't got that revenue in place, you're not going to get any more funding and you you're not going to succeed. So I think for Diana, we, we probably overlap in some area because my son's company is also in Singapore, Karana, uh, which, is, which is very much built on, on climate, uh, climate change and sustainability. 
and you talked about the agricultural sector too. Uh, you may know about a company called uh, Muliang or Viagu, uh, and and so I, I'm involved in a very small way with them, and uh, they're they're just going for a listing on Nasdaq right now. Where Muliang, which is an agricultural large agricultural enterprise in China, have taken over Viagu because they have the the technology and done a share swap, and using using the technology of Viagu to enhance the agricultural sector in China. Uh, so, um, you know, if you if you've got if you've got that added benefit as Viagu does to to a traditional business then again, it's not just a funding aspect that we're talking about here, but it's a case of, of your startup being able to be acquired and still be useful and have the founders involved. Thanks. Very insightful, wonderful range of, of different perspectives relative to the uh, experience of, of being an entrepreneur and, uh, and the things that we, uh, we need to tend to. Um, Greg, you spoke earlier about some, some important industries where, where people were citing uh, opportunity. Uh, in, uh, um, in in education and in electronic uh, communications, as well as in, in food and, and, and the rest of that. Um, there's been a whole series of other um, uh, um, suggestions as well uh, through a lot of the literature throughout Asia as well um, in, into uh, into retail and mental health. And, and uh, you, you mentioned telemedicine and, and uh, um, uh, medicine, healthcare uh, be, being big as well. And also, uh, um, you know, some some people have spoken in and around fintech uh, too. So I'm just curious if anybody sees something uh, particularly uh, of interest uh, that might be in, in the market where you are that you think is is going to kind of kind of steer up a little bit um, that you might want to add to relative to those or any others. Maybe I can just comment not not on a particular mm-hmm. on a particular company or anything, but but of course now we're all talking about the vaccine and what we're trying to think about here is the entrepreneurial gale and what opportunities there are. So with this vaccine company coming, I think people need to start thinking about all the ancillaries. So what are the ancillaries? Needles, containers with tops, refrigeration, three D printers, labels, waste management. There's a huge increase in disposable PPE. So they're the sort of things that, that if people start to get into those areas, the, the task ahead of us um, in distributing this vaccine is enormous and the opportunities for assisting in that are also enormous. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else see particular areas of opportunity that uh, either we have mentioned that you'd like to elaborate upon or, uh, or, or others? Yeah, Aronisa. Uh, fintech, you mentioned fintech. Uh, the fintech uh, is uh, getting the tailwind now because of the COVID. Because the, the because of COVID, uh, people uh, doesn't want to touch the you know uh, coins on the bills box. So mm-hmm. the, the the many people want to cashless uh, solution um, and uh, transferring the money. In in Japan, actually, the cash resolution was not good comparing to other countries like China or Singapore. But the nowadays, uh, people like it, <laughs> even the old people, because uh, old people are old, more has a, more having a risk of COVID. So all the people wanted to use the real cash, but the nowadays the uh, trend is to use a uh, cashless because of. And uh, I think that will not return to before. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. To to Greg's point, the distribution networks and how the distribution will happen is going to be a major uh, major play for the future. Um, What we are seeing, or what in in the sourcing industry, what we're seeing is a big change from the traditional uh, platforms for matchmaking. So, you know, the big platforms like Alibaba and Made in China, etc., became really big, but they don't take any accountability, responsibility uh, for any of the products that are sourced. And, and some of these products, the PPEs, as well as these uh, vaccines, as well as testing kits, etc., are sold on these platforms but they don't take any accountability of these things. The future is going to be platforms that can take accountability. One of the forays we made was in PPEs and we are taking full accountability of every product that is sourced and we are making it. Today it is possible to do, uh, if your credit card allows you, if you have a black 
Amex, you can do a million dollar transaction online and there is enough security available to do those transactions online. There is uh, there is secure tech and insure tech companies uh, that can insure those transactions. There is logistics companies that can make sure that the logistics of that transaction are taken care of. And there is many other tools around that to bring in transparency into the trade. The future is going to be solutions like these uh, that that what Greg was saying earlier uh, or, or somebody else said about that the COVID one thing that has done across industries, it has been kind of a catalyst which has moved that reaction that would come in five years to this year, uh, which would come in 10 years to this year, technologically as well as need wise and people accepting like uh, Hirano San said, people accepting cashless ca cashless transactions across the age groups, people accepting that they can do transactions online. And this is going to be a major, major change. If you know the retail industry also this year, the online platforms and the online retail is uh, as compared to last year, the second quarter saw a 75% increase in online retail in the US alone. And those all will be impacted furthermore. And how startups, how new uh, innovators in Asia will play a role into these changes will be determining their success or failures. Well said, well said, very well said. So yes. yeah, go ahead, Diana, please. So I, I just wanted to add on distribution um, with Greg and Minesh and um, absolutely agree that um, B2B, um, the face, the future B2B e-commerce will change. Um, it is um, like what Minesh said, um, it is not no longer platforms just like Alibaba. Um, I have great respect for the work they do, um, Amazon as well. But when we talk about B2B e-commerce, uh, we talk about um, fraud prevention. And um, this is where, you know, the diff numerous types of technologies um, from blockchain to IoT to sensor tech needs to come in play on a platform, especially at the uh, verification and vetting process. And that is what we do um, at OneAgrix as well. You know, we make sure, especially dealing with agri-food, um, and, and uh, we want to make sure that the food that is being distributed globally um, is ver from verified suppliers is, um, when they say it's global gap certified, make sure the certificates are really global gap. When they say it's halal certified, make sure it's halal cert certified. We've seen fraud increase in a COVID-19 situation. And this is where, you know, um, platforms like ours, which have such tools, um, actually do very well in a COVID-19 situation because we see that um, buyers, B2B buyers, right down to end consumers are expecting transparency um, in what they eat and our food security comes naturally in this and food security is not only growing vertical farming and growing your own food i mean I, i've spoken to some vcs and they say that that capacity to support a country takes time mm -hmm. so means import and export of food still is is needed is very much needed but how do you protect that how do you make sure it's safe? How do you how do you make sure future generations have food which is not tempered with? So that, what Minash is saying is true. The future of um, B two B e commerce will change. The future of um, procurement and sourcing will change, and this is the future where it's verified um, platforms end to end solutions as well. That's why you know we form really great partnerships um, with global companies from logistics to end um, payment. Escrow is a very important um, um, portion of B two B trading. It's not just um, credit card. Um, you know, we partner with escrow.com based in US, which is very important because they are SEC regulated. It instills confidence in B2B buyers. Um, logistics as well, um, partnering with a huge logistic firm that owns 20% of containers in the world because supply chain logistics is um, being disrupted right now. Mm -hmm. And if let's say we even even when we had Nestle on board um, our company, what happened was they said that they have their own um, distribution channel. They have, they have their own logistics. But if one agrics have that, they, they, they don't mind looking at that as well. So that what Minash and Greg said about distribution and logistics is very important um, to, to um, you know, um, Pina's, um, uh, you know, thing about fintech. It is also important. How do we address the farmers who are unbanked, who are underbanked? And we have a great partnership with that. As I was mentioning, partnerships and strategic alliances is important. It's important for startups to grow. And, um, you know, we partner with um, Vesi Cash in Africa to help these farmers um, who are unbanked so that they get paid when when they trade B2B. For them, obviously it's not large scale, they are smaller quantity, but it also small cross border trade is actually important for their livelihoods as well. So um this is the future of how um I see it goes for ourselves and for 
all a lot of other platforms out there, the earlier they realize that technology is a tool for them to actually, you know, um, help others and um, be sustainable and be profitable, the, the, the better it is. Yeah. Scott, I want to add something to what Dinah just said. Yeah. And, you know, because we say corporations, we say partnerships, yeah. working together. In the past, also people did that. But in the past, what was not possible was the integration of APIs. Uh, with APIs today, so if it is a finance organization, a trade finance company, uh, insure tech company, or a logistics company, or a distribution company, all of them are building their own APIs. And the way technology is going, we all will will build our core competence and our core APIs, and we can combine everybody else's APIs to make our solution stronger. What the Alibaba's and the other big giants or Amazon's, they're developing their own APIs for their own use, which is going to be the past. That is not the future. The future is when you develop with everybody else and you use the core competence of everybody else. Love that. So yeah, exciting. I, I want to add one thing. So the, I agree you not know, only the thinking about the, all the stuff, uh, digitalized. And uh, when um, the more and more uh, things are digitalized, then uh, the more and more uh, digital uh, liability will be important. That means, <laughs> I, I would say I, that, that the blockchain technology is very important. And uh, as a market uh, getting the speed, the technology need to get the speed. Thank you. Well said. And, and so uh, bringing it back to the entrepreneurs again, um, recognizing that there's so many different ways we could get into business and also recognizing, as, as Greg said earlier, uh, starting a business is easy and maybe even having the idea is easy. It's, it's what do we do from there? I'm, I'm opening it up for you to provide some advice for the entrepreneur who do they talk to? How do they how do they do all this processing and flexibility? Like, what does your ecosystem look like uh, as you're starting up uh, your business or growing your business? Who, who are you talking to? What? How are you managing that? And um, uh, I'm just curious if you have any advice for how the entrepreneur can manage herself uh, as, 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 she's, as she's growing the company uh, relative to who she talks to. I, as an entrepreneur, Scott, I will say that one big mistake a lot of startups do or startup founders do is we start talking to investors and angels and VCs too early on. Forget that. And what Greg said, nobody, none of these people are going to help you. And if you need their help to grow, you should not be in business. You should be focusing. And I, at least from my end and what I tell my company is let's just focus on revenues. Let's focus on becoming profitable as soon as possible, or at least breaking even as soon as possible. And then we'll talk to the investors. Let's forget about everything else for the time being. And for that to happen, the only people you need to talk to is your customers. Mm -hmm. Nobody else. If you're not talking to your customers, if not selling your product, you're doing something wrong. Good advice. Anybody yeah. else? Uh, yes, uh, sir. My, my take. Um, uh, it's is relatively the similar to uh, Minesh. Uh, the uh, the uh, food to talk with. My advice is not to knock on the door, the investors or angels. So uh, on the other hand, on the please let them uh, knock your door. So that means uh, the in this uh, stage or the environment, uh, it is important to increase your presence online. Or the either cloud or the the SNS kind of stuff. So when you uh, knock on the door, their door, um, they will uh, see you uh, from the upper side. But uh, uh, when they knock your door, uh, you can um, apply more uh, freely, flexibility, and uh, more uh, dreaming. Uh, kind. So um, instead of uh, knocking the investors, angels, uh, the uh, make uh, use of use of time to uh, make a presence on the net. That's I absolutely agree um, with with Tina. Uh, you know, let them knock on the doors. I mean, um, COVID nineteen have seen angels coming to us instead of the other way around. Last year, we were like, how how do we actually bring this ecosystem that we are building, right? But um, COVID nineteen, like what Abina said, build your presence online. That's true. 
thought leadership is important. And I would like to say one thing, though, seek mentorship. Um, I, I've learned the best from um, three advices that we have on our board. And I think it's, it's very important to seek mentorship earlier. Obviously, you do not need to have 10 mentors at once. You know, um, just they identify those relevant ones, uh, one for leadership, one for the industry, um, one for technology and have this um, a, a mentors earlier because it helps a startup. It opens doors much quicker. Um, for us. So I, I think a lot of founders, um, they, they tend to want to struggle on their own when not knowing that, hey, there are advisors and mentors out there wanting to help and give back. So um, yeah, that, that's um, the, the only thing I would like to add. Fantastic. Uh, I agree with what Diana just said. Um, it, again, it's one thing just to have an idea, but, but how do you get your idea across? Yeah, there are, there are companies that, that are specialized in of reviewing ideas and investing. There's one in Singapore that does it, and they usually put up about twenty-five thousand US dollars into into relevant startups. But but talking about what Diana was just mentioning, it's it's mentors and advisors, and those mentors and advisors have different roles to play. Uh, so, using the example of my son's company, Run, um, I, I think of networking, being able to to have a network available. Hopefully, I've been able to help him with with doing that. Um, and and like uh, to use another example of another company that I've invested in, which is Algorithma, which is a data science um, education company. So from from that, um, I've been an advisor to their company. I've been able to introduce them to people in Singapore, where they're now they've now got business in Singapore, and they are teaching uh, at the two universities in Singapore how to teach data science. All of that comes from just having a contact that, that is open. And, and so um, having the advisors and the right advisors with not just one area, but different areas. Mm -hmm. Because your advisor isn't just someone who tells you, well, oh, this is a good way to do your business. Your advisor may be also able to introduce you to the people who are going to fund you. And I, there are several examples that I can give of that one too. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I'll, I'll carry on. Thank you very much. Uh, boy, this has been such a, a robust uh, discussion. There's so many great, what we call them nuggets here in the United States, just great, great little things that people can take away um, if they're listening carefully as we go. And now I, I feel what our role is, uh, panel, is we're speaking to uh, a whole bunch of potential entrepreneurs who should be looking forward. And now uh, what, uh, what words of encouragement can we give them about this day and age to step in and help be part of that business as a force of good? Does anybody have any, any uh, final advice or encouragement we'd like to share? We've got a couple of minutes. Don't be afraid. This is the best time because people are afraid. Those people that take on the challenges are going to succeed. Well said. Anyone else? Um, uh Yes. Um, so, Scott, I think I mentioned about the open concept just now, the open mindset, but I would just like to add, um, be flexible like a bamboo. Now it's a great time to be agile, be flexible, um, be open, like what Aminesh said, um, do not fear, just, um, you know, go on. Just what I would like to say, though, is research a lot before you dive into something. Make sure that you, you do have um, your, your support system. And, and I think before just jumping into the water just like that, um, of course, make sure that you have the support system. I mean, um, this is in addition to the open mindset that I've actually mentioned just now. Thank you very much. Okay. So yeah. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> focus on the changes. It is a rare chance that the entrepreneur can make a new world. Love that. Thank you. All right. Uh, Greg, anything uh, further? You good? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, be flexible. Okay. Be flexible. Be prepared, be prepared to, to change your ideas and, uh, and develop things as they go along. But also just to mention that we've had crises before, many, many crises. In 2008, we had a global financial crisis. So uh, we didn't have an Alibaba before then. But just talking about Asia, what came out of the 2008 financial crisis? Okay, Grab, Talkopedia, and, and many others. So these are the times of opportunity, not the times of crisis. 
Thank you. And I would just add uh, with a great amount of gratitude uh, to each of you and all of our attendees and those that will watch the recording. I also just want to add that every crisis passes. And and uh, so it, in the moment of crisis, it will go away. It does pass through. And there is incredible opportunity ahead for all of us. So we want to encourage you to uh, continue to make our world better, continue to make your worlds better, and um, uh, we can grow our businesses as we do it. So thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the um, Asia meeting. Bye for now. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.